All right, we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Definitely appreciate you guys taking the time and um, joining us here today. Um, what we want to do is Cisco has partnered with Pentesta Academy, and we want to help everyone understand the different types of attacks, right? So we want to talk about attacking Active Directory because the shift is happening. And we want everyone to understand this paradigm shift because the more they understand the paradigm shift, the more they understand the different types of attacks that an infrastructure network will have, um, the better prepared, right? So knowing is half the battle, I remember that on GI Joe, so we wanna make sure that you know at least something to look for in your net network that typically you may not find, right? Um, when you see some courses, when they talk about recon, they talk about ping, they talk about NMAP scans, they talk about uh, ARP scan, but those sometimes are a little bit noisy. So when you start attacking and you look at the Active Directory, it's a little bit different because the traffic is mixed with everyone else. So we want to give you guys the opportunity to understand these attacks, and then we'll talk about mitigation techniques and things of that nature. So, um, Nikhil is no introduction himself, but um, for those who don't know him, we want to talk about when you go to work and you look at your SOC, your, uh, your monitor, your help desk, your network engineer, and you have one of these OMG moments, right? How do you prevent that? Or what do you do when things like this happen? What's your first step? What's your second step? So you see the effect of it, but what is the actual cause? So what we want to talk about is one of those particular causes. So for those who don't know our featured facilitator or instructor today, uh, he's definitely been in the industry for a while. We're going to be using, and you guys should have gotten your lab credentials, and we'll go over that in a few minutes as far as signing on, to the, the test portal. So if you want to learn more about Active Directory attacks, Pentesta Academy is a great resource for that. They have the attack in the defending Active Directory class. Um, they also have an attack and defender active directory lab as well. Okay. Now the individual that we're about to see has created many tools. He's a creative niching. Um, he teaches at Black Hat um, in Europe, Asia, and in the US as well. And so definitely when you have a chance to attend this class, definitely would do that. And so now what I'm going to do is just hand it over to him so we can start the most important part of the day, which is the class time and the lecture. So let me pass in the ball. Hey, thank you so much, Otha. So hi, everyone. Let's get started with hacking Active Directory. Uh, let me share my screen. A couple of things about me. As Otha mentioned, uh, you can find me on Twitter as Nikhil underscore M-I-T-T. The lab which we are using in this class, uh, that's, uh, that is something which you can find on this URL. I actively blog at laboforpenetrationtester.com. You can find some of my open source toolkits on my GitHub, on, on my GitHub account. I'm the creator of Nishang Deploy Deception Race Toolkits. So Nishang and, uh, Deploy De uh, and Race are useful for red teamers. And deploy deception is something which uh, is more or more useful for two teams. We're usually interested in offensive information security, new attack vectors and methodologies to on systems and active directory environments. I have spoken multiple times at DEF CON, including the last live DEF CON, right? Not the virtual one at Black Hat, uh, multiple editions of Black Hats at uh, different locations, BrewCon and a lot more conferences. So what we are going to discuss in this uh, class is we'll begin with brief introduction to Active Directory. We'll have a look at our attack methodology. Then we'll start with normal port scanning and enumeration. So that would be a very quick part. Then we'll go for domain enumeration, how we can extract credentials from an Active Directory environment from different boxes. We'll see where the where are different credentials stored on a domain joined machine. Then we'll spray those credentials or try them across multiple machines and uh, domain controller, etc. Then we will go for domain privilege escalation. That is, how do we get the domain admin or equivalent rights? And then finally, how do we dominate and persist with high privileges in an Active Directory environment? 
right? Those of you who have the lab access, you may like to try things uh, with me when uh, I have dedicated hands-on or demonstration sections. So you may like to try stuff uh, um, when, when I'm showing off the demonstrations, right? So let's begin. So uh, let's start with the philosophy of, oops. I need to minimize this. So let's begin with the philosophy of the workshop. We will assume that we already have internal network access. Uh, please note that we are not going to use any exploit in the class. We are uh, going to use only uh, on, uh, we are going to rely only on abuse of functionality and features. Uh, the point being that any functionality or any feature, they are rarely patched. I mean, why would someone patch a functionality or a feature? So we would focus on the inherent trust, which domain machines have on each other. And we'll see how we can abuse that functionality to start from an attacking Linux machine, which is not, of course, not even part of the domain to the domain admin privileges. Uh, please note that there are many techniques which can be executed using different tools. I'm going to stick to the more popular ones, let's say like Metasploit, although not one of, I mean, a very popular tool, but not one of the best ones to attack Active Directory, but still I'm going to try and use that one as much as possible to, to lower the bar for everyone to, to get an entry into the Active Directory security world, right? So uh, that's that's the philosophy of this uh, workshop. Now let's begin with some basic uh, introduction to Active Directory. So Active Directory, as the name suggests, it is a directory service, which is used to manage Windows networks. Now everything in Active Directory is an object, right? So Active Directory stores information about those objects and then makes it available to users, machines, administrators, et cetera, right? The textbook definition of Active Directory is that it enables centralized secure management of an entire network, which might span a building, a city, or multiple locations throughout the world. So this is what the Active Directory network, or this is what Active Directory looks like. As I said, everything is an object, right? Uh, whether it be a Windows user, or a Windows server or a client or other objects, everything is considered an object and they have everyone have or everything has their own attributes. For example, a Windows user may have account information, privileges, uh, office address, phone number, a Windows server may have the operating system version, etc. Now for all of these objects, what Active Directory provides is these three services, manageability, security and interoperability. This is what Active Directory is. It provides these three functionalities for these different types of objects. And these objects could be located anywhere in the world. Uh, but of course, they should be connected over a network. So that is what Active Directory looks like. A very quick overview for those who uh, have not seen this. Now there are four basic components of Active Directory, schema, query and index mechanism, global catalog, and replication service. So the schema is what defines objects in their attributes. So for example, if we go back to this diagram, what would be the attributes of a Windows user? Once again, account information, username, SAM account name, logon counts, etc. All of these are attributes of a Windows user. Now, schema is the component which, which defines that, that, okay, a user object will not have an operating system version, but a computer object will have that. So that is what the schema part is. Then comes the query and index mechanism, uh, which provides searching and publication of objects and their properties. Now, because Active Directory can be, uh, different Active Directory objects can be anywhere in the world, so it is required to have a query and index mechanism so that users can search other users or they can search other computers, computers can search other users and so on. Now, because it is a distributed network, 
then there must be a catalog which contains all the information. So that component is called global catalog or GC, which contains information about every object in the directory. Now in any active directory environment, which is a, a, a forest, which is called a forest, every domain controller has a copy of the global catalog, right? So that it is easier for any user to look for or to search for other users and computers, right? And that too very fast. So that is why there is a local copy of, or there is a copy of global catalog with every domain controller. Now, because there can be multiple domain controllers, and usually there are more than one domain controller, that is what it is recommended for, uh, an, for an environment to provide good, good availability. Because there are multiple domain controllers, there must be a way so that the domain controllers can synchronize with each other so that they have the same set of information, right? For that, the replication service is used, which as the name suggests, distributes information across the domain controllers, right? So these are the basic components. Finally, what is this or how does the structure of Active Directory looks like? One thing which I would like you to keep in mind is whenever you hear the word Active Directory, think of it as a forest, not a domain. Always think of Active Directory as a forest. There are a couple of reasons for that. One, as stated by Microsoft, forest is considered the security boundary, right? What does that mean? That means that, for example, in this simple diagram where we have a forest, two domains and multiple OUs, if the domain one is compromised, that is someone gets domain admin privileges on domain one, the adversary or the attacker can very easily move to domain two. And that would be working as intended. And the other way around is also right. If someone gets domain admin privileges on domain two, it would be trivial for them to move to domain one. Because between two domains of a forest, there is no security boundary and there can't be any, right? So whenever you think or you hear the word Active Directory, think of it as a forest. And then a forest may have multiple domains and then they can have multiple OUs. OUs are the units on which group policies apply. And that is why I've used them in the structure part. So that's the basic or real quick view of what Active Directory looks like. Now, the methodology which we are going to use in the class, that's Assume Breach. Now, Assume Breach is used by Microsoft's Cloud Red team, amongst other teams. Now, uh, they define Assume Breach uh, uh, very succinctly in a single word, in a single sentence, sorry. It is more likely that an organization has already been compromised, but just has not discovered it yet. So, what does that mean? In place of the traditional uh, reactive security that is we we assume it as we assume the network perimeter and we assume that we are locked and loaded in trenches and then there would be enemy coming in and then we will try to block them in uh, passing our parameter perimeter so right that is the traditional way of security now of uh, the assume breach methodology is proactive that is we assume that we are we or the organization that has already been breached they have been already compromised but we have to go ahead and hunt or discover the adversary or the attacker so now it contains of these six uh, steps or sessions red teaming insider attack simulation blue teaming execute post breach monitoring em monitor emerging threats and war game exercises we are going to focus mostly on the insider attack simulation part, right? So that is going to be our methodology. That is, we are not going to have a look at, let's say, client-side attacks or uh, attacking services like web apps or API endpoints, et cetera, to get our foothold. We assume that we already have a foothold, right? We are going to cover most of these phases of insider attack simulation. We'll very quickly have a look at recon super quick, right? And don't want to spend much time on that. Then domain enumeration. Then we'll go for local privacy. Once we have privilege escalation, 
on one of the machines that is we have local admin privileges on one of the machines we we'll start to hunt for or look for uh, the local admin privileges on other machines or if any of the users which we have compromised they provide us any other access on one of the machines then we'll go for lateral movement domain admin privs cross trust attacks we cannot cover in in the time which we have dedicated for the class and then and we look for the persistence part right now the lab environment which we are going to use that's once again uh, based on one of our uh, labs what the what does the lab contain it contains fully patched server 2019 machines uh, with windows defender turned on so that there is at least basic set of antivirus on all the machines uh, the, the target machines have a server 2016 for us functional level the target domain has that functional level please note that there is no 2019 for us functional level so whatever you see in the class that is going to be applicable for at least five to seven years down the line in the enterprise active directory environments why one because we are going to test stuff on server 2019 machines second the forest functional level is the top notch the best you will get right so now before we go ahead with our first slide those of you who have the lab access let me show you how would it look like so if you go to this link and sign up for the lab you will get access to a lab portal like this this is for me right you can go ahead and set up the lab let's say for me the nearest location is let's say southeast asia so i set up the lab there because we have a complex uh, lab setup in the background there are multiple machines which prop up and then we have to configure some vulnerabilities connectivity between them etc so it takes some time and in part it all it is the the delay or the time it takes up is also in part uh, thanks to our cloud provider it's it's them as well right so it takes uh, literally seven to eight minutes to set up the lab right once it is set up you'll get a lab url here and you it would be possible for you to generate some credentials uh the lab environment also I mean, the lab portal also provides you the flag verification for my user. I think all of them would be, or some of them would be done. You can get flag, do flag verifications. If you submit all the flags, they'll get a course completion certificate. There are course videos, walkthrough videos, lab manuals, course slides, etc. right? I should not have clicked that, right? Now, that is what the portal looks like. And once your lab setup is complete, once the lab setup would be complete, you will get a lab URL here, which looks like this. Now, this is the URL which we have shared with those users who have signed up for the lab. Now, you can go ahead and enter your username and password here. So, uh, Please note that we have shared the passwords in clear text because those are dynamic passwords, right? And you can change them with a single click, not, not on the lab, but if you have the lab access to the lab portal. Once again, let me uh, clear this. You do not have access to the lab portal, but the lab URL, right? So this is something which you have to sign up for. Now here you can go ahead and access. So in this lab, what we have experimented with is to provide the victim view for every machine so these are the target machines in the lab if you want you can straight away and access any of the machines as, ad as administrator even the domain controller the idea behind this thought process is to provide even the blue teamers a chance to have a look at what happens on the victim right now also note that other than the domain controller the windows machines are uh, Windows core servers, that is the servers without a GUI. Uh, why I'm mentioning this? Because the core servers have a very small attack surface area. It is super reduced, it has super reduced uh, attack surface area. So once again, if you abuse something on a server 2019, a machine which is patched and it is a Windows core server and it is server 2016 forest functional level, 
then it is literally something literally the most updated stuff which you can find in any enterprise environment even for years down the line for now we can go ahead and access uh, the attacking machine which is a kali machine uh, a linux uh, machine uh, in the target environment right now we can go back having after having a look at this and start with our attack methodology so let's uh, have a quick look at port scanning and enumeration and of course for that we are going to start with nmap now port scanning is definitely as uh, many of you might already know even if you don't port scanning means we look for live machines on a network and then open ports that is what services are actually listening in that target environment right which services we can connect to or we can access to now nmap contains many interesting flags which we can use uh, st dash s uppercase t st is for full connect tcp scan that is uh, your nmap will complete the three way handshake the tcp three way handshake with the target uh, port and therefore it is very reliable but of course a bit slower then comes the ss which is a half connect scan the, this one does not complete the three way handshake but therefore it is faster but a lit, uh, little bit less reliable then comes su for udp scan of course because it is udp there is no reliability at all that's what the uh, usp of udp is right uh, then comes sv for service version detection dash o for operating system detection and dash sc for default scripts to check for vulnerabilities on the open ports right so that is, uh, these are some of the popular NMAP plug, uh, plugins or uh, parameters or options which you can use, right? So once we have identified Windows machines on the local network, uh, that we'll see in the, in the demo part. Once again, those of you who have joined late, I have named them demo, demo one through demo nine. We have nine uh, demonstrations, but those of you who have the lab access can try with me. Coming back to this slide, once we have identified Windows machines on the local network, now there are very interesting enumeration techniques that we can use, right? I'm not going to spend time on, let's say, NBT scan or uh, running enum for Linux or tools like that to find out the names of the Windows machines or something like that. I mean, those are useful, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that enumeration part, right? That is something, uh, enumeration is something we, which we will uh, focus on once we have compromised a domain joined windows machine uh, now of all the enumeration techniques which you can use from a non-domain joined machine one of my favorites is to look for open shares on any of uh, the reachable machines now what are open shares open shares can be world readable or world writable shares right uh, we would be interested in looking at any such share from where we can read something interesting or in fact if we can save or write something uh, on those shares uh, so that if a user opens up uh, that particular file we get let's say uh, a net ntlm hash of the user or something like that we can as run smb relaying uh, attacks or other things right so we would be interested in having access to any of the open shares now we will use metasploit framework for that why as i said i'm trying to lower the bar, the entry bar for Active Directory security. In my experience of teaching Active Directory security for close to six to seven years now, what I have observed is that even the seasoned security professionals would look at Windows machines as, as a single machine, right? As not as a part of a domain, right? They miss out on the inherent trust which Windows machines have on each other when they're part of a domain. So I'm trying to lower the bar to make it popular make it uh, available for everyone and that's that's the that's why we are focusing on using very popular tools like nmap or metasploit framework for that so those of you who uh, don't know that metasploit framework or framework or msf it is an enumeration and attack framework we can find out and enumerate vulnerabilities vulnerable hosts misconfigured services using msf and then we can exploit them to get access to those target machines now msf contains some different types of modules like auxiliary 
exploit, payload, post modules, and more. Auxiliary modules, as the name suggests, they're used for enumeration, scanning, recon, and for info gathering, etc. Right? That is to to get information or to extract information, but usually without any sort of intrusive information. Right? Something which you can extract without engaging with the target machine. Um, without intrusively engaging, of course, you have to engage with the target machine, right? Uh, you can use show auxiliary command to list all the auxiliary modules once you run the Metasploit console. Then there are exploit modules which are used for targeting a specific vulnerability, right? Uh, you can use show exploits command to list all the exploit modules. So what is an exploit? Let's say you identified a vulnerability on, on a target machine. Now, exploit is the module which you use to run some command or code on the target machine, right? Let's say uh, that popular uh, CVE, which everyone is talking about on Twitter. So if you identify a target device with that CVE, which is vulnerable to that CVE, that is the task of the auxiliary module, then when you copy and paste the exploit for that from a researcher's GitHub repository, that is the, I'm just kidding. So that is the exploit. And then comes the payloads. So the payload is the code which executes on the target on successful exploitation. Let's say you simply want to add a user, you exploit a Windows machine and you want to add a new user on that machine. So that net user command which you would like to run on the target machine, that is called the payload. You run show payloads in MSF console and you get a list of all the payloads. There are, there are superb set of payloads in Metasploit. Some of them uh, are superbly done, right? So let's have a look at the lab. So uh, these are the tasks cut out for us. We need to use Nmap to identify, identify live machines in the local network. And then we need to enumerate open TCP ports on them and if we can, then operating system in use. Once that would be done, once we identify uh, Windows machines, then we will use Metasploit to enumerate open shares on any of the live machines, and then check if we have any right permissions on any share. So let's have a look at this. Once again, those of you who have the lab access may like to try with me if you want, or just have a look at stuff. I'm going to copy and paste the command most of the times to avoid any noise from my keyboard and to avoid making any typos, right? So here, what I would do, I will first start MSF console because it may take some time, a minute or so to start. And in the in another terminal, I will run the Nmap scan. So what I'm doing here is, let me stop this. I think I should increase the size a bit. Right. So what I'm trying to do here is as we discussed, uh, we have SS flags for Nmap, which is the half connect scan, right? Uh, we are using a couple of more interesting options here. NVV, N stands for no name resolution. We are not trying to resolve any of the IP addresses, no name resolution here. Uh, we want double the verbosity so that we are aware of the progress which Nmap makes. T4 is the template. There are five templates with Nmap, T1 to T5, T1 the slowest, T5 is the fastest. We are going for T4. Ups, because some, in some cases, in some rare cases, old devices may crash if we run T5 in a network. And then we are trying to force scan the local subnet. And how do we know this is the subnet uh, to be scanned? Because um, that is the subnet to which our 
attacker machine belongs to, right? So once we run that, we'll get a quick list of the machines in the target environment. As you can see the, here, we, we are looking at machines with port 3389, port 445, which means these are Windows machines, right? And then there are some machines, for example, this one, 192.162.2, where we have port 389, which is the LDAP port. And let me scroll up. So we have 389, which is the LDAP port, 88, the Kerberos port. So this machine is in all probability a domain controller, right? What Nmap has also identified is by their MAC address that these are Microsoft machines. So uh, for quite, uh, we can be quite sure that these are some Windows machines. So th this was our first two tasks actually. Now we need to use Metasploit to enumerate open shares on any of the live machines. Uh, please note that uh, we identified some of the machines here, but I, I'm assuming that you have uh, wrote down the IP addresses. I'm not writing them down. I have that in my cheat sheet, right? So here we go for Metasploit. And now I'm going to use an auxiliary module, which is the SMB scanner. Right now, whenever you load any Metasploit module, you can use info commands like info. Always feel free to use the help command. That of course shows some useful help. Now, if we have a look at the options of this module, uh, you would see that there are some options which must be set. Right. So let's first populate the R hosts. Now, what would be the R hosts? The target hosts. And where do we get the value from? Now from our Nmap scan. So note the method I'm using to populate the R hosts. Uh, the Metasploit allows to provide the target hosts in this format. So we have 192.160.2.2. This one means 2.21, 2.169, 2.78, 2.165, 2 right? And now we can go ahead and run this. And you will see that we do have at least read access on 2.21 and shares are admin dollar, C dollar, files, and IPC dollar. Now, please keep one uh, very important thing in mind. Admin dollar, C dollar, and IPC dollar, these are special shares on any Windows machine. And if these shares are world readable, I mean, world writable, it would be even worse. But if, if, even if these are world readable, then that is uh, some recipe for disaster, right? And uh, this is not the default configuration. So either this machine is royally screwed or this is a false positive. But one thing which uh, is still of interest here is this one. Now this files share, that's not a standard share, right? So this means that probably this is actually a share and now we are going to have a look at that. So our fourth task was to check if we have write permissions on any of the shares which we discover. So we have discovered a share called files on 192.168.2.21. We can now go ahead and, so this is going to be a working directory because all of our tools, et cetera, are in the root test of tools directory. Now we are going to use the SMB client I'm going to use the SMB client utility to connect to the file share. Let's list if there are any subdirectories there. Uh, we have logs and maintenance there. Let's see if 
you can find something in the logs directory now. Do we have something in the maintenance directory? Yes, we do have something. Uh, we have a partial script probably going by the extension that's going to be a partial script in dot ps1 so let's download this one let's see if we have only the list privileges or the read as well as you can see we have the read privileges so let's exit from this and read the cleanup.ps1 script now this script is a script to clear logs from C logs every five minutes. And then there is some command, right? Now, what does that mean? Of course, it's a, it's a setup, but it is super prevalent in any Active Directory environment or in any enterprise environment, right? So what does this look like is it's a log cleanup script and going by how enterprises use partial scripts, probably this is run by a scheduled task every five minutes, right? Now, in my experience, scheduled tasks are used very widely and there is absolutely no control or validation of what they execute. What do I mean by that? So it should be possible that if this script is run by a scheduled task, we, if we have the right privileges, we can write whatever we want inside this cleanup.ps1, put it back if we have the right privileges on the uh, on uh, on the maintenance directory here, and that should be executed, right? But before that, let's check if we actually have any write permissions, right? So we go back, we connect to the file share. So this is on 192.168.2.21 slash files slash maintenance. Let's put hello.txt here. And as you can see, we can actually write here. Still, there could be a chance that we could not overwrite this, but let's try that out. So, uh, So we go here and then we would like to overwrite that, but I think that's not part of our current hands on, right? Right. So that's that's all what we wanted to do in the current demo, right? We wanted to check if we have write permissions, permissions on any share. And we found out that we have on 192.168.2.21 slash files slash maintenance, we have the right permissions. Right? So that ends our hands on one. Now, let's have a look at Metasploit's payload generation. As we discussed earlier, Metasploit has different types of payloads. Some of them are really powerful and interesting ones. We can use MSF Venom from Metasploit for generating payloads. That's the uh, payload generation utility in which comes with Metasploit or MSF. For our current scenario, that is, if we would like to, uh, as if we assume that, okay, we, whatever we write inside that cleanup.ps1, that would be executed by a scheduled task. Let's write a metapreter in PowerShell. Let's generate one, and then we'll copy that one into cleanup.ps1, right? So let me run this one. I'm going to copy that just to avoid any typos. Right. And meanwhile, it runs. Let me explain the command to you. So what we are doing here, we are calling the MSF Venom utility. This P is for specifying the payload. We are using a metapreter reverse TCP which should run on a 64-bit Windows machine. If, if you, and this is something which you may or may not be able to enumerate in advance, right? So it is always advised usually to go for a simple command exec payload and gather some basic information about the target machine. 
or you can if you want to brute force the stuff you can create payloads for either the universal payloads or you for 32 bit and 64 bit and check which one of them works right but keep in mind that brute force is always more noisy. I mean, I'm calling this brute force. It's not like that we are brute forcing credentials, but we are using brute force, right? Uh, trial and guess, that is you create payloads for different uh, types of OS architecture and check which one which works. So coming back to this, we have Windows X64 Metapeter Reverse TCP, which is a non-staged payload. I'm not going to explain what are stages right now, right? And then dash F is for format of the payload. We want the metropeter to be in PowerShell, right? And then L host, because we are choosing a reverse shell, a reverse shell is the one which calls back home, right? Which connects back so that it can, uh, uh, it, uh, it can connect across firewalls because firewalls are usually more strict for inbound traffic, but are uh, more, uh, they allow more connections outwards, right? So our reverse TCP will connect back on 192.162.1, which is our Linux machine. And we are using the default L port, which is 4444. And we want to create this, or we want to save this in a file called payload.ps1, right? Which, as you can see here, is generated. And now if I have a look at the payload.ps1 uh, payload, those of you who are well versed with PowerShell will immediately identify that this is indeed a PowerShell script, right? Even if we have a look just at the last couple of uh, commands here, right? That's, uh, that's so PowerShell, right? This means that we have uh, we have generated a PowerShell payload. Now, what we would like to do is, before going ahead, let's have a look at what what Metapeter is. This payload which we have generated here. Metapeter is the most popular payload in MSF, of course. It completely stays in memory. The communication communication for from uh, Metapeter is encrypted. But it is so heavily fingerprinted by antiviruses that it still gets detected if we use the default options, right? Although uh, not all, but most of the detections are signature based. So some minor changes to Metapeter may still allow you to use it without any detection, right? But we'll we'll find some other way to still use Metapeter on a fully updated Windows Server 2019 machine. Now, if when we have a Metapeter session in the Metapeter, Metapeter prompt, we can use the help command to list available options. So the help in Metasploit is pretty robust, not very descriptive, but still makes everything very useful. So make sure that you use the help command pretty freely. Metapeter also has extensions to extend its functionality. So some of the very popular ones are Kiwi, which loads mimicets in memory of the Metapeter process. PowerShell, Incognito, etc. And how do you load the extensions? If you type, let's say, load Kiwi, you will load Mimikatz in memory using the Metapeter session, right? Now, interestingly, if you were uh, paying attention here, of course you were, uh, you will find out that we created, or you would have noticed that we created a PowerShell Metapeter. Now, with Windows PowerShell version 5, Microsoft introduced many enhanced security controls when it comes to PowerShell. Now, one of them is quite interesting, anti-malware scan interface or AMSI or MZ, which is introduced to tackle abuse of Windows scripting languages by attackers. Now, what are these Windows scripting languages? For example, PowerShell or JScript, VBScript, all of these are Windows scripting languages. Now, before MZ came into picture, if you are using a PowerShell to run PowerShell scripts in memory, then unless the antivirus on the machine is looking at the process, the memory of the PowerShell process, then it was really, really hard to 
actually detect in-memory script execution. Now, what MZ does is it enables scanning and inspection of dynamic scripts, regardless of where they are executed from. And that scanning and inspection is done with the help of the antivirus on that particular machine. Note that MZ has zero detection logic of its own, and it depends absolutely on the registered antivirus on the machine. If the antivirus is MZ aware or if the antivirus is MZ capable. So let's say we want to load a partial script in memory. As soon as you try to execute that script, MZ steps in, grabs the content of the script, regardless of them being encoded or not, grabs the content of the script and passes it on to the registered antivirus and ask it to, hey buddy, please, please check the contents of the script. Do you have any signatures of the script? That's the question which MZ poses to it. Do you have any signature for this particular script or command? And now it is up to the antivirus if it is signature-based detection. So air quotes, right? Signature-based detections. Air quotes because signature-based detections are really uh, usually easy to bypass. Nonetheless, if there is a signature for that script, then it is blocked, right? Now, because we are using a stock Metasploit payload, right? We have made no modifications here at all. Because we are using stock payloads, the, the, the payload will be detected. Therefore, we are going to use an MZ bypass before using that payload. Now, because the, the bypass is also public, we are going to obfuscate that. It, I mean, we are not going to obfuscate it. We are going to use an obfuscated version uh, so that it is not detected, right? Now, this brings us to our next hands-on. We need to generate a Metapeter payload in PowerShell format using MSF Phenom. That is something which we have already done. And then we need to use the payload with MZ bypass to get a Metapeter session on the target machine 192.168.2.21. Right? This is a machine where we identified the writable chair. So let's get down to the business, right? Now, one very interesting thing which we, uh, which I have identified while working with uh, PowerShell payloads in Metasploit, sometimes as soon as you get a Metapeter session using a, a PowerShell payload, it immediately uh, is killed, right? So a very simple, and I, you, I'm using BI here, right? A, a very interesting way to avoid that is to simply add an infinite while loop, which I, of course, one, once again, I'm going to copy uh, a simple infinite while loop at the end of our code, right? So, right. So what we added was this, so that uh, as soon as we get a metapeter session, that does not get killed immediately. The MZ bypass, which we are going to use is this one, which is an obfuscated version of public of one of the public MZ bypasses. And let's modify. So right now, what is the copy of cleanup.ps1 we have? That's the copy. Let's modify this one with this. So what do we have now? Uh, let me explain the command. This is IEX. This stands for invoke expression, which is a built-in PowerShell commandlet, which uh, executes the expression. Now, what is the expression here? What is the script block here? We are downloading the MZ bypass, IWR invoke web requests. That is the curl equivalent of PowerShell uh, with an option of use basic parsing, which you need not know about right now. And we are uh, downloading and executing the MZ bypass for. So what we are doing here is we are downloading and executing the MZ bypass. And in the same PowerShell process, then we are downloading and executing the payload, which we generated using MSF Venom. So using this way, what we are trying to do is 
is to bypass AMSI even when we are using the stock metropeter payload, right? So we have our cleanup.ps1 ready. And I'm going to run a web server here, right? Which will serve our payloads, etc. And then in the MSF console, I'm going to start a listener. Let me copy it. Right. So what I'm doing here, I'm using a listener called exploit multi handler. For the multi handler, the payload which we are going to use is Windows X64 Metropeter Reverse TCP. That is the one which we generated using MSF Venom. Right. We are setting the L host to 192.160.2.1. That is also the same thing which we used in MSF Venom. Right. And rest of the options we are leaving for the default ones, once again, as we did in the case of MSF Venom. Right. So let's run this. And now we have started a listener on our own machine and a web server. Now is the time to go ahead and once again access the writable file share. Right, and put the cleanup.ps1 partial script, the one which we modified here. Oh, so that's in the root desktop tools directory. So we go to the maintenance and then we try to put cleanup.ps1. So it is put there. Now, if, if there is actually a scheduled task as we suspected, then first we should get a couple of hits here because remember our payload contains a download and exec of MG bypass and a download and exec of payload.ps1. And once we have that, then we should have a metropeter listener here, right? So it should not take time. And if it takes, we will wait for the scheduled task because I think it executes every five minutes. So we may have to wait for that. Uh, okay, so as you can see here, we got a connect back for our, for MZ bypass and a connect back for payload.ps1 and a metapeter session here, right? Uh, so this is what our, and this is with get UID is a metapeter command. Always run, use the help command to get a, get some help about your uh, metapeter session or anything in Metasploit. So we are running as, or we have the privileges of Cola file admin. Now this is significant. Why? Because this name format signifies that this one is probably a domain. Right. There are 10 ways of actually confirming that, but I'm not going to uh, dive into that right now. Right. For example, uh, you can use environment variables to have a look at user domain. Let me show that. So to be absolutely sure that this is actually a domain machine, you can have a look at something like this. So if we have a look at the environment variables, you can have a look at this part right user domain or the fqdn of user domain that is user dns domain is cola.local that's the user domain and i believe you can have a look at the dc as well using the logon server if i can find it here even if it is not we'll enumerate that later on right so this means that uh, we got access as a domain user here, right? So I'm backgrounding that metropeter session. And whenever, whenever you want to have a look at the sessions, we can use the sessions command. If you want to interact with one, use sessions-i and the ID 
of the metapeter session, right? So that was our hands-on too. Now, once we have access to our machine in the target domain environment, we can start with domain enumeration and map various identities, entities, relationships, etc. Right now, in the lab, we are going to limit our enumeration to specific tasks. But in a real assessment, enumeration is the key to success. The more time you spend on enumeration, more are the chances of success. Right, and uh, I mean, with so many different defense. Uh, techniques or technologies like let's say EDRs or honeypots or deception technologies, the more time you will spend on enumeration, more are the chances of uh, not getting detected. So what are the tools which you are going to use for domain enumeration? Microsoft's own Active Directory module. I maintain a mirror of the AD module, which is nothing but I simply copied the Microsoft signed Active Directory module from a domain controller to my GitHub repository. There are no changes into that, into this one. And even if you check the signature, once you uh, you copy it, it will it will still be perfectly right Microsoft signed. It's, uh, it has a valid signature. So this is the module, the partial module, which you get once you have the R set ADDS, the, the remote administration tool for Active Directory installed on your machine, that's what you get. You'll also have a quick look at PowerView. And because there are some enhanced uh, security controls in PowerShell, then we will also have a quick look at, look at SharpView, which is a .NET port of PowerView, right? So what are the things which we can have a look at? We can have a look at the current domain, for example. So the this command in darker font, that's power view, the command lighter font, that's the Active Directory module, right? So we can have a look at the current domain. Uh, if you want to have a look at the domain SID, you can have a look at that as well. Domain controllers of the current domain, let's try these out, right? So I'm going to use the AD module, because that's my favorite, right? Why? Because it is Microsoft sign, so chances of detection are really less. Not only that, in my knowledge, in uh, as far as I know, this is the only offensive security tool, offensive partial security tool, which works even in the constraint language mode. It, the AD module even works in PowerShell CLM, right? Everything else doesn't work, which makes it super useful. So why not utilize this one? So in our Metapreter session, we are going to use the upload command of my interpreter right to upload the ad module onto the disk you are touching disk fearlessly why although not very good at opsec but because we are using a microsoft signed tool which is not flagged by any antivirus yet we can safely do that now let's drop to a PowerShell session, we uploaded uh, the zip archive to see users file admin downloads. Let's use that. Right. Oops. And so we have that archive here. And now we are going to use expand archive, which is a PowerShell command let not a metapreter command. We are in, the, in a PowerShell host right now inside uh, the, the metapreter session. So metapreter commands will not work right now. So if you see here, we now have extracted that and now I'm going to import the module. To import the module, uh, it is a two-step process. We first import the DLL as a module. This is fine. It's okay, even if we get this error. And then the module itself, right? And then we can run, for example, get AD domain to uh, 
Okay, let me try this once again. So if I run net user, let's, let's say slash DOM. Uh, okay, let's try with this one. And if I go here now, hmm. okay, let's try it once again. But our domain control should be fine. And that is why actually I like the victim view. So we can actually go and have a look at our DC if it is fine. Now the DC looks good. Uh, let me quickly check if I have some firewall issues. Uh, could be very uh, local to my uh, my instance of the lab, because of course I tested it just before the class. So if I have a look at the firewall, Ooh, probably let me check if if turning this one off makes any changes. So here, if I run net user DOM again, ah. okay. This is something we can. Uh, I will try to resolve during during the uh, the coffee break or something like that. Uh, but it should be possible for us to actually enumerate stuff. Let me try this one more time. Let's get our metapreter session once again. And if you still get the same result, then that would be some trouble. Right. So the idea is that we can now go ahead, meanwhile, we get a metapreter session. We can go ahead and extract a lot of interesting information from the domain now, right? Like the name of the domain, domain controller, et cetera, a list of users information about a particular user. And then we can look for some very interesting stuff, like uh, we can search for a particular string in a user's attribute. Now this is very interesting because in many cases, let me check this one real quick. So we have the privileges of this domain user. And if I run, Okay, I will have a look at this during the uh, during the coffee break. So we can actually extract some very interesting pieces of information like this one. So when we run this particular command, either from Power View or the lower one from the Active Directory module, what we get is, or what we are trying to do is, uh, we are looking in the description field of all the users and looking for a particular term. For example, in this case, we are looking for the term called, or a string called built. So when we run this, we would get two users, the uh, the, dom the default domain administrator and the guest user because description for both of them uh, has this string built in them, right? So this is useful for looking at or finding out passwords in those cases uh, where the user's password is written in the description field. Now, is this is that really common? Uh, unfortunately, it is, especially for service accounts where uh, an account is used to run, let's say, a service, and the person or the persons or the team who use that service account uh, you many times write the password in the description field whenever the password is changed so that the service can still be kept running and the account complies or it is in compliance with the password policy. So 
To find out interesting strings like passwords in the user description field, a command like this could be super useful. Uh, next, we can get a list of computers in the current domain. We can use get net computer from PowerView or get ad computer from uh, the Active Directory module. Then we can filter on basis of, let's say, operating system. We would like to see what all operating systems have server 2019. We can use any of them, right? Once we have all of this information, then we can go ahead and we can have, uh, we can now start looking at the groups. So if we run get, let's say the command get ad group or get net group, we'll get a list of all the groups in the current domain, which is quite the equivalent of running net group dom. We can get members of a particular group, let's say the domain admins, we can uh, use that as well. Note the recurse parameter from PowerView and recursive from the AD module. Or what these parameters do is, or what this parameter, I mean, it's an individual for the command. What it does is, if there is a group which is a member of the domain admins group, it would identify its membership. And if there are multiple nested group memberships, then it will keep enumerating up to the last member of every group, right? So it is quite uh, useful in identifying nested uh, group memberships, which may result someone in getting domain admin privileges by mistake, right? And the other way around is also possible. That is, if you would like to check if uh, what groups a user is a member of, let's say you want to check the user file admin, if this user is a member of, uh, of, of uh, which groups this user is a member of. So we can use get net group with username parameter in case of power view or get AD principal group membership from uh, the Active Directory module, right? Now this brings us to our hands-on three, that is to find a user in the cola.local domain with, and this is uh, what we discover, discussed here, right? Uh, such a user whose password is written in user description, and we may like to use the AD module, power view, and sharp view. Right, so that is what our task is here. Uh, so, mean I'm going to quickly once try to reboot the DC, if it is actually the problem with the DC, and I'm not doing anything wrong. So, while you're rebooting the uh, the main controller, we can take a quick five minute bio break for. All right, so. I have to actually reboot one more machine, so I'll do that in a jiffy. So Cola SRV needs to be, that one also needs a restart. Right. So, uh, for now, we can uh, we have to right now go ahead and actually assume that we run this one. So uh, we have to enumerate the uh, any of the user which has a password in the user description. So if we if we get that stuff uh, up and running, then we'll have a look at it. Otherwise, what uh, happens here is we get a user called Sara, which has the string in of the a description field and then we are going to have a look at and uh, we'll try to go ahead and spray uh, those credentials right so right now we are done with the domain enumeration part and also the local privacy because if we check the file admin user actually has local admin privileges on the target machine so now we are on the next phase where we try and but we uh, where we try to get admin privileges on other machines as well, right? Using the admin recon phase. We are in the admin recon phase right now. So admin recon plus later movement. Um, now let's have a look at where we can extract credentials from. So where are the credentials stored on a Windows machine, right? So there are so many places where we can look for credentials. So the first four, where we absolutely must have administrator privileges. 
memory of the Alsace process. This is by far the most popular storage of credentials which we we or attackers like to abuse. Then there is a registry key called LSA a registry hive called LSA secrets. So the memory of the Alsace process has credentials for service accounts, interactive logged on users, uh, machine account. LSA secret uh, secrets has credentials for local uh, sorry for service accounts, right? SAM Hive has uh, credentials of uh, local users and admin account. Credential Vault has the credentials of uh, of those, let's say, web pages which you save if you are using Internet Explorer, right? So that's what the Credential Vault has. It also has, I believe, the credentials uh, which you, if you save using CMD key, I think that also goes into the Credential Vault. Then there are some uh, credential storage or password storages where you may not need administrative access, right? For example, unattend.xml, you can find this uh, file in cpanther directory of many uh, uh, VM uh, virtualization to uh, virtual, virtualization technologies, like for example, ESXi, that also leaves an unattend.xml. Then similarly, there is uh, sysprep.xml. These XML files uh, may have clear text credentials, not only for the local admins, sometimes even for domain admins. And you, you do not always need local admin privileges to read those files. Then there are auto logon credentials. Auto logon credentials are stored in registry in clear text. Uh, these are used, uh, the, the use of auto logon credentials depends a lot on the type of industry which you're targeting. So, for example, your target environment is, let's say, an advertisement agency, and they have their kiosks at many places, and there is no one to actually go ahead and log on to a Windows machine, right? So, what they would like to do is someone simply turns on their kiosk, it automatically logs on, launches an application which runs an advertisement, right? So, auto logon credentials are used in such cases a lot. And non-admin users can read auto log on credentials and the credentials are stored in clear text in registry. That's also one of the places. And one very recent entry to, to this is PowerShell console history. Now, what is this PowerShell console history? Uh, Windows PowerShell 5 onwards come with a very interesting, and that I'll show you on my host machine on my, on my laptop. Uh, comes with a very interesting uh, module which is enabled by default that is the get P, uh, that is the ps read line right it is a module which comes uh, installed and enabled by default and if you run this command guess ps read line option you will see for that particular user a console history text file which is reboot persistent and it actually logs by default it logs all of the commands which that user has run, has ran ever. I mean, unless the history count is breached, right? So you can either change the history save type or save style or simply go ahead and remove the PS read line uh, module. But by default, it is enabled and keeps logging everything we run in a PowerShell console across reboots, right? So using that, we can actually go ahead and get access to some interesting credentials, even if they are used in PowerShell. Now we have Metabriter as system. Uh, we have it as file admin, but we can run get system to get the system privileges on Cola file SRV. We can go ahead and extract credentials from the memory of the LSS process. So that is our next hands-on, that is to extract credentials from Cola file SRV using Kiwi extension of Metapeter. So let's try this here. For one more time, I'm going to check if we can actually go ahead and enumerate the domain. It would be great if we can, otherwise we have to let it go for now. Nope. So I have to take some more time to troubleshoot that, but that is fine. We can actually Uh, have a look at other interesting stuff meanwhile. So our task in this case is to have a look, uh, so is to extract credentials from Cola file SRV, right? So for that, 
uh, we are told to use the Kiwi extension, but before we load Kiwi, we must disable AV on the target machine, right? So let's do that. Those of who you are who are unaware, PowerShell, and that is why it is very popular with attackers, provide a very interesting commandlet called set MP preference, using which you can actually go ahead and disable. Uh, I, I have to type it. Set MP preference disable real time monitoring to true now when you run this command uh, okay. let's run it again I copied a string access, that's fine. So when we run this, this command disables temporarily Windows Defender on the target machine. Now, please keep in mind that since I think October last year, Microsoft pushed temper protection on Windows client OS like Windows 10. Now, if temper protection is turned on, you cannot disable Windows Defender with this command. But on the server operating systems, as far as I know, it has not been pushed yet. So we can use it at least for now. So let's exit from this. And now we can use the load kv command to load Mimikatz in memory using this metapeter. And then we can use the quads all command from kv. Once again, okay, because we are on this, please always keep in mind that get system is not an exploit, but it is a feature abuse, right? So there seems to be some misconception. And when we run creds all here, you can see that we extracted the credentials of extract credentials from for what user for let's say for file admin, that's the NTLM hash. And yep, that is it right now we do have access to sarah's credentials right although we could not uh, have a look at that and that is something which we are going to have a look at now credentials spring so now we have access to credentials of sarah in clear text which came from the user description i can show you that in the victim uh, view so that you, you at least get to know what I was talking about. So, so the command which we can use or which I should say I wanted to use was this one. So from the AD module, if I run this, what we are effectively doing, this is the command which I wanted to run from that MetaPeter session. What we are doing here, we are listing all those AD users whose description field is not set to null. So we got three built-in ones, and then we got a name user called Sarah Hale, and whose description looks password-ish, right? This, this looks like a password, right? So we got this one, and then we got the hash of file admin from our metropeter session, right? So we got access to two set of credentials. And once we have that, now we can go ahead and try those credentials against multiple machines in the domain and check if they are valid. Now, if they are valid and if they provide us administrative access or any other access on other machines. Now, before we go ahead, let's define credentials. What are credentials when it comes to uh, Active Directory? At least four set of uh, four pieces of information can be considered as credentials in Active Directory. One is, of course, clear text password, right? Then comes the NTLM hashes. 
Then comes the AES keys, both AES128 and AES256 keys. Both of them can be used as credentials. And then comes the TGTs, the ticket granting tickets. If we have access to a valid TGT of any user, we can actually use that or replay that TGT to access the resources which the user can access, right? So these four uh, pieces of information can be considered as credentials when it comes to Active Directory. Then we have access to credentials of two users, as I said, Sara and file admin. And in next hands-on, we are going to spray, that is, try these credentials against different machines and check if we have access to them, right? So let's first go with the user Sara. So I'm going to use the SMB login module once again, the one which we, we use enum shares, not SMB login. So auxiliary scanner SMB login, what this auxiliary module does, it takes some piece of information like the username, domain, password, our host, etc. Once we provide these pieces of information, this machine, this module will go to each and every machine which we provide in the R hosts, connect to it, and try the credentials which we provide. So our domain is going to be Cola. That's our current domain. User in this case case is going to be Sara. Pass is going to be the string which we found in found in Sara's description. And what is going to be our hosts? Uh, all the machines which we discovered. using our nmap scan right now one very interesting thing to load here is uh, to note here is sorry is if we are using a domain user if we simply want to validate if that credential is valid or not we can simply go ahead and authenticate only against the dc why because in case of domain all authentication occurs for a domain user only at the dc so even if we set our host to all of the machines, the authentication ultimately is going to be on to the DC, but still providing our hosts here will help us in identifying if this user has administrative access anywhere. So if we run this, you can see that this user can actually access all the machines, right? 2.21, 2.35 and so on. But we do not see administrator written in front of any of them. Otherwise, Matterspark lets us know that. This means that this user has, I mean, the credentials are valid. This string is actually a valid password, but we do not have administrative credentials or administrative privileges here. Not only Matterspark, we can have a look at, for example, a very popular, another very popular tool, CrackMap Exec. We can have a look at that to check the credentials or to spray the credentials. So here you can see that using crack map exec, we can authenticate to all of these machines using the SARA user and the credentials or the string which we found in its description, right? Now, one uh, very interesting opportunity or one very interesting thing which we can have a look at is is if it is part of this demo actually no uh sorry that's that's it about this hands-on right we spread the credentials of sara not of file admin yet we'll do that later on and found out that we have access to other machines in the network using sara all right now uh, one very interesting a protocol to remotely access machines is PowerShell remoting. Now, those of you who have not used it, PowerShell remoting is enabled by default on all the Windows Server OS after Server 2012. That is from Server 2012, 2012 R2, 2016, 2019. For all of them, PowerShell remoting is already enabled and an uh, exception in the Windows Firewall is or a rule in the Windows firewall is allowed to let it through, right? And it is the recommended way of managing Windows servers. And of course, that is why it is very useful for adversaries and attackers too. In fact, for 
of Windows Core machines, as you can see here, for Windows Core machines, it is the recommended way of accessing or managing the machines. Why? Because even if you RDP, this is an RDP to the file SRV machine, even if you RDP to a Windows Core server, you would still get only a command prompt, right? A, a, a native command prompt. So if you use PowerShell remoting, then that allows a very powerful management system without the, uh, the additional resource which an RDP session may consume. Uh, PowerShell remoting by default listens on port 5985 uses HTTP as a transport protocol and Kerberos as the uh, authentication and encryption protocol. There are three basic commands which you can use to uh, use PowerShell remoting. New PS session to establish a PowerShell remoting session. Enter PS session to interact with a PowerShell remoting session and invoke command which can be which uses PowerShell remoting to run commands parallelly on thousands of machines. Right, so all three of them, them are super useful. Right, so let's check if so. Our, our um, hands on is to get a metropeter on Cola SRV2 by using PowerShell remoting from Cola file SRV. So, because we are told to use uh, PowerShell remoting, let's check if, as Sara, we have access to any of the machines using PowerShell remoting. Now for that, we are going to use another uh, auxiliary module from Metasploit, auxiliary scanner WinRM, WinRM login. So uh, PowerShell remoting uses the WinRM protocol in the background. So once we have the module loaded, let's have a look at its options. So it's quite similar to the SMB login, right? We need to provide SMB domain, SMB username, password, our hosts, right? So let's provide all of the, that information. Right. So you set the domain, the username, the password, and our hosts. And let's run this. So it turns out that on 2.35, which is Cola SRV2, right? We have the privileges to access PowerShell remoting. Now, those of you who have used PowerShell remoting uh, in the past, this uh, should be surprising for you. Why? Because when we ran let's say the crack map exec on SMB using SARA's credentials, on Cola SRV2, we do not get administrator privileges, right? Those of you who have used crack map exec, crack map exec appends a pond in, in front of uh, the machine name or the credentials if you have administrator privileges. So there was no such thing. The same behavior was shown by the SMB login, uh, SMB login uh, auxiliary module in Metasploit. So what's happening here? In all probability, the SARA user is a member of the remote management group on Cola SRV2 on 2.35Y because the members of the remote management group are allowed to connect to a machine using PowerShell remoting even without having administrative privileges. For all other users, it is necessary to have administrative privileges to be able to connect to a machine using PowerShell remoting. Same is the case for WMI, right? So that's about, that means that we have access to 2.35 using PowerShell remoting. Now our task is to get a Metropeter session using this PowerShell remoting access. So let's first use our session on Cola file SRV, right? Uh, let me, Hear this. Right, and what we are going to do, so there are two ways of loading PowerShell in Metapeter. One which we have been using is we drop to native shell using shell, and then we write PowerShell there. And then there is a PowerShell extension. Right, so this time let's use the PowerShell extension. 
and please uh, note the commands which I'm going to use now. Uh, so I'm going to create a PS credential object and then try to access the, the Cola SRV2 over PowerShell remoting from this Metapeter session. Now, because PowerShell remoting uses uh, Kerberos authentication by default, and the target, uh, the, and uh, if the connecting machine is not trusted, for example, in, in our, this case, Linux machine is not trusted, it would not be possible for us to connect to remote machine using WinRM from this Linux prompt or from, from this Linux uh, terminal, right? Therefore, we are going to do that from our Windows machine, Cola file SRV, where we already have the access. So what we are doing here, we are creating a credential object, right? And this is why it is very useful to have a look at the PowerShell history of any machine which you compromise, right? That is what exactly the real use case of PowerShell history is. We uh, went ahead and created a PS credential object for the SARA user. Kola SARA is the username, and this is the password which we used here, right? So now the dollar creds variable holds a PS credential object, and we can go ahead and use that in PowerShell remoting. So what we are using here, we are using the invoke command uh, commandlet from PowerShell. And in the script block parameter, we are specifying these three commands, which we want to run on Cola SRV2 by using the credential dollar creds. The one which we created here, right? Let's run this. So here we will see that we get an output of the host name command, which is cola SRV2. Then we got an output of the who am I command, which is cola SARA, because that is the credentials which we used here. And then the local administrators group. So this is a partial equivalent of net local group administrators, right? So here we can see that SARA is not a member of local administrators, right? Domain admins is another domain user called Mary is the local administrator is, and there is another local user called SSH agent, right? All of these users are the local administrators, but not the user Sarah, right? Now, our next task, let me exit from this one. Right. So task was to get a metropolitan session using this. So first we need to start a listener. Now note that we already have a listener running on port 4444, right? That is where our, our metropolitan session on Cola file SRV is listening, right? So let's use the same payload but we change L port in place of double four double four, we use a triple four three this time, right? And in this case, previously we simply ran exploit. Here we are using dash J and dash Z or dash Z here. So dash J is that we want to run the session as or the listener as a job, and dash Z means we do not want to interact with the session. We'll have a metropolitan session open, and then it will relegate in the background. Now we need to create a payload using MSF random, right? So let's do that. So this is the command which we can actually, oops, we can run. I interrupted it. So it's the similar, same to the one which we used previously. The only change is this time we are using triple four three. So let's run this. Right. Previously, we used L host 192.162.2.1. That's the same this time now, but we are using triple four three this in this case. Right. So once we have our payload and it is in the desktop tools directory, which our simple HTTP server is serving over HTTP 
port 8000. Now we can go ahead here and run the following commands. So once we drop to a PowerShell session, let's run this particular command. So what we are doing here, it is exactly same as we did line by line previously. We create a PS credential object, right? Up to here, right? We create a password, then we created a dollar creds PS credential object. Then using those credentials, we are creating a PS session and we are storing that PS session in a variable called Cola SRV2. And then we run a command on Cola SRV2 using that session which we created. And what is the command? The command is this, the one which we used in cleanup.ps1, right? We first download and execute an MZ bypass, and then we download and execute the payload, payload443.ps1, which we created here, right? So let's run this. So what happens when you run this command is, our, our Metropolitan session runs a partial remoting command to connect to Cola SRV2 and then runs this, right? Let's background this one and our Metropolitan session as well. And here you will see that we have a Metropolitan session on Cola SRV2 as SARA user, right? And that, is what our task was here to get a metropolitan on cola srv2 by using powershell remoting from cola file srv right so this was our little movement now let's talk about continuing with little movement let's talk about acl attacks now what is the access control model in active directory uh, it enables control on the ability of a process to access objects and other resources. So whenever a process wants to access an object, there is there are two uh, pieces of information that are involved. One is access tokens, and second is the security descriptors on the target object. So the access token contains security context of the process. What is the security context of the process? The identity and the privileges of the user. So identity, let's say the user is, for example, Kula Sara, and what are the privileges of the user? And then on the target object, there are security descriptors, uh, which contains SID or seed of the owner, and two types of ACLs, discretionary ACLs or DACLs, or system ACL or cycle. The discretionary ACLs defines the permissions which a principal, which could be a user or a group, have on an object, and cycle is used for auditing, that is logging of success or failure of a particular uh, write on that particular object, right? Now, is decal is a list. What is the list made up of? The list is made up of access control entries or ACEs. Now, an ACE corresponds to an individual permission. And ACEs are vital to the security of any Active Directory environment, right? So this is what is looks like. So uh, one thing which we are going to do in the next hands-on is to have a look at the ACL of, uh, or those ACLs where let's say file admin has interesting privileges, right? So this is how uh, it looks like in the GUI. So for example, let's say we want to have a look at the ACL of the domain admins group, right? If you go to the security tab and advanced, so this permissions tab, this is the DACL or DACL, and this audit auditing tab is the SACL or SACL. Now this permissions group, if we have a look at, let's say, and how do we read these ACEs? This individual entry is an ACE, and it corresponds to a single principle. Right. For example, if you want to understand this ACE, so how do we read it? This is how we read it. This is an AC, ACE of type allow. This is for the domain admins object. 
and the principal system has some access on the domain admin object. What are what are those access? It's full control. So by reading this ace, we understand that the system principal has full control over the domain admin, right? And this also uh, raises a very interesting question: Why are domain admins domain admins? I mean, how do they have such high privileges uh, in an Active Directory environment? So this is the reason. For example, if we go ahead and have a look at the ACL of any object in the domain, you will see that the domain admins will have full control or almost full control over any object in the target in, in the Active Directory. And this is default, right? Um, nothing like anything which is set up or something, correct? Now, this is what makes ACLs super important. Why? For example, we can simply go ahead, let's say for this Mary user, once we have enough privileges, or let's say there is a misconfiguration, or uh, even if there is a delegation. So for example, if we delegate control of an OU to a user, even in that case, ACLs are modified for that OU, right? So we can simply go ahead, for example, let me take the example of the user, which we are going to target next. If we have a look at the ACL of SQL access user, you will see that file admin user has full control, domain admins user has full control. So what does this mean? This means that if we compromise the file admin user here, we will have full control over SQL access, right? Now, what would that SQL access mean? Oh, sorry, full control mean, right? But before that, I showed you how we can list ACLs or have a look at the ACEs using GUI. But how do we get that using the command line? So we can have a look uh, uh, at the get object ACL from PowerView. We can pass a SAM account name or an ADS path or an ADS prefix. We can also use the Active Directory module, but that would not resolve the GUIs, which is fine. So once we import the module, we can use commands like this to access or list the ACLs. Right now, coming back to uh, the controls or the rights, uh, some of the directory service rights are very useful for attackers. Right, uh, the impact of different rights are different uh, on on various types of objects. For example, if we have generic all or full control, uh, it would mean uh, it means that we can do whatever we want on that object. For example, if it is a user object, we can reset the user's password. We can add a service principal name. We can remove the pre-authentication requirement. We can set the password to never expire, etc. Similarly, if we have generic right, let's say once again on a user object, we can add a service principal name. Now, how does adding service principal name helps? If you add a service principal name to a user, that user is uh, that user then becomes a service account for the domain controller, and you can try to kerberoost that user. That is forced kerberoosting, right? So that is how generic right helps. If you have generic right on a uh, on a group, I think you, I believe you can go ahead and add users to that group. Right property. So this this these rights are in decreasing order of uh, privileges, right? Generic all is rare to find. Generic right, right you may find. Right property is very carelessly used. So once again, its example is you can go ahead and modify SPN for a user object. Right decal, a very interesting uh, right to have. Right decal allows to modify the ACL of the object. Right. So for example, if you have the right decal uh, right over admin as the holder. You can go ahead and modify the ACL of admin SD holder. Now, this is a queue for you, right? You can go ahead and read about the admin SD holder. It is a fantastic uh, method of persistence, right? I'm not going to explain this. So, a queue for you here. Go, go ahead and read about the admin SD holder. A very uh, interesting defense mechanism abused for persistence. Then there are, so these were some generic and control rights. There are, then there are some extended rights. For example, DS replication get changes. There are three rights, in fact, two rights which we can use here. 
Uh, with only these two writes over the domain object, you can go ahead and run vCSync without having domain admin privileges. What two writes or three writes? These writes. If you have a look at the ACL of the domain object, you just need to have these three writes replicating directory changes, replicating changes all, replicating directory changes in filter set. If you have these three writes, you can run DCSync attack without having domain admin privileges. Another very popular extended, there is a typo here, so extended write is user force change password. So even without having, let's say, generic write over a user, if you have these permissions over a user, you can go ahead and reset password without knowing the previous password. So uh, please uh, understand the difference between changing the password and resetting the password. To change the password, you must know the previous one, but for resetting the password, there is no need to know the previous password, right? Now, we need to enumerate ACLs in colal.local where file admin has write or modify permissions. This is unfortunately something which I have to skip because our enumerations are failing. Uh, but let's go with the second one, abuse the permissions to compromise another target machine. So we already saw that file admin has uh, full control over SQL access. So now we are going to abuse those permissions to compromise another target machine. So as a POC, what we are going to do, we are going to reset the password of SQL access because file admin has full control over it. This is not very OPSEC safe because you are going to uh, invalidate the legit password of the user or if it is a service account, then that service will stop working. But as a POC, it is fine to use that, right? Uh, and I have to check even if we can, if we are actually having troubles with the domain, if we can actually use that. Let me let me check. Let's try it in any case so that we at least have get to know that. So we interact with our session on. Uh, Let's revert to self so that we uh, have file admin privileges in place of system. And what we will try to do is we'll try to use the AD module to reset the password of SQL access, right? Once again, if it fails, do not think that, I mean, don't judge me, right? <laughs> that, uh, that is something, I mean, some uh, computer stuff, right? Something misbehaving. We can always fix that. Right, doesn't look like that. This thing is not in a mood to uh, let me perform this. So what should we do now? I mean, I can show you the command at least. Don't want to do it from the DC because that looks like we did it from the domain with the domain admin privileges, which is correct. So the command is actually this. Once we have imported the AD module, we can simply go ahead and run this. So what we are doing here is we're using the, this command from the AD module, set AD account password. For which account? SQL access. What do we want to do? We want to reset the password, and this should be our new password. So nonetheless, let's run this from the DC so that we get to at least have a look at it. So if I run this here, not this, uh, you will see that, uh, in fact, when it comes to this, I can actually try to, uh, uh, Try to check if I can use something like this, right? And no, not SQL admin, it's file admin. And what I will do, I'll type out the password here for file admin so that I can show you how, I mean, it looks exactly like this. Let me try this. Oh, of course, this is the DC. Sorry. 
So this is how it looks like. So what happens now? Uh, SQL, we have set a password for SQL access. And we can go ahead now. And check if the password works. Right? How would we check this? We'll use the same command which we used earlier, right? For checking the credentials of Sara. So we are going to use the SMB login. And this time I'm not going to explain the parameters. We have already seen them. So right, we are simply trying this on one of the machines. And here you will see that we do have administrator privileges, right? I mean, uh, we could go ahead and set this uh, our host to all the machines and we would have, oh, uh, let me do that, I'm just explaining that. Let's set our hosts to all the machines so that we spray the credentials on all of the machines. And you will see that it was successful on all the machines because it is a domain user, but we get administrative privileges on just one of the machines, 2.169, which is Cola reports. If uh, I, have, I still have that here. Uh, 2.169, which is Cola reports, right? So this was the abuse to compromise another target machine, right? Uh, so this was demo seven. Now we have not abused it yet. Let's use another very popular tool when it comes to abusing AD from Linux. Uh, not on this one, sorry, wrong terminal. Uh, and that is Impacket, right? So here you're going to use the SMB exec now from Impacket. And what was the password which we set? It was password at one, two, three. And here you will see that we are running with system privileges on Kola reports, which is 2.169. Correct. And of course, we will have an H for uh, a metropeter session now, right? Because nothing is complete without a metropeter session. So let's kill other sessions because we don't need them now. And let's start a listener again. And here we are going to use our download execute cradle, which first bypasses MZ and then runs our metropeter in PowerShell, right? Once we run this, uh, we should have a hit here. I think that's, that's the one. And here we should have a metropeter session as system on Cola reports, right? So this was our ends on seven. Okay, so we will be running a bit short of time. So next, what we are going to discuss is Kerberos delegation, and I was hoping to have more time for this. Well, let's let's uh, uh, cover this up a bit quickly. So what uh, Kerberos delegation is? Kerberos delegation was introduced in server two thousand and three to address a very peculiar, a very specific problem that was impersonating or reusing the end user credentials. So for example, let's say a user wants to, uh, or a user authenticates to a web server or a web application running on a web server. Now that web server has a web application which retrieves data from a database server based on the user's privileges. So if this user is, let's say user A, then the, use, the data would be relevant to user A. If this user is user B, then the data would be relevant to user B and so on, right? Now, for this to happen, the web server must have a way 
to authenticate to the database server as this user, right? That is what the delegation part is. That is the user authenticates to the web server. That's the first hop. And the web server wants to authenticate to the database server. That is the second hop. This is the classic Kerberos tuple hop problem. And the first attempt to solve it was in server 2003 with Kerberos unconstrained delegation. So what happens in case of unconstrained delegation is when the user authenticates to the web server, so these first four steps, these are user authenticating to the DC. So at the end of step four, when the DC provides the user a TGS, or let me uh, quickly go through this. Step one, the user provides, sorry, Step one, the user provides the DC, it's a timestamp encrypted with its credentials. DC validates them and responds with a TGT in stop in step two. TGT is the ticket granting ticket, a ticket which gives a ticket. So a TGT is sort of a credential when it comes to domain, right? Step three, the user returns the TGT back to the DC to prove that uh, it has the credentials, the request is coming from the user and request a TGS for the web server. The DC decrypts the TGT and responds with the TGS for the web server. Now, when the, when the DC looks at the TGS, looks at the web server service account, it knows that that web server is configured for unconstrained delegation. So when in step four, the DC responds with the TGS, ticket granting service, a ticket which grants access to a service, it embeds or encapsulates the user's TGT inside the TGS. Now the user presents the TGS to the web server. The web server decrypts the TGS because the TGS is encrypted with the NTLM hash or hash of the web server service account. It decrypts the TGS and gets the TGT, but it cannot decrypt the TGT. So what it does, step six, the web server and note that this is where the impersonation takes place. The web server authenticates to the DC as the user because it has the user's TGT and requests a TGS for the database server and then authenticates with, and then presents that TGS with the database server. So this is how the user impersonation takes place. The double hop problem is solved and the web server accesses the database server as the incoming authenticating user. This is what Kerberos delegation is, right? There are two types of this, unconstrained and constrained. We just discussed unconstrained delegation. You can use this slide, there, are, there is a lot of text on this. You can use this as a, as a reference slide later on. So for unconstrained delegation, uh, now you might like to, or you might have already guessed that the problem lies here, right? Why? because the web server will have TGT of every user which authenticates to it. To it. So if a high privileged user, let's say a domain admin authenticates to the web server and the web server is compromised, the attacker will have access to the TGT of the domain admin and then it can access any resource in the entire domain, including the domain controller as the domain admin. That is, it would lead to a complete domain compromise, right? Now, how do we abuse and constrain this unconstrained delegation? We enumerate and identify computers which have unconstrained delegation enabled. Once that is done, we compromise that computer, right? I mean, easier said than done. But once we have compromised that computer, we can then force a high privilege account like a domain admin or a domain controller to connect to that computer. Once a domain controller or a high privilege account is connected, we extract the TGT uh, from LSS using Mimikatz or Impacket or whatever. And then we inject that TGT of that high privilege account and profit. That is how we abuse the unconstrained delegation, right? So let's have a look at that. So first we need to find a computer in Cola domain where unconstrained delegation is enabled. So using Impacket, we can use the find delegation.py script or utility 
to discover such machines. So no points for guessing. Cola reports the machine which we compromised in the previous hands-on. That is the one which has unconstrained delegation enabled, right? So now how do we compromise the machine? We already have a metropolitan session on that machine. We just need to extract the credentials of that particular machine. That is the machine account, Cola reports dollar. So let's first Disable the, uh, the antivirus here. And then we use mimic ads. Uh, but this time we are not going to use the uh, creds all, but we are going to use the secure LSA E keys to extract the credentials here. Now note that we are going to use the AES, uh, both the NTLM hash of the Kirby key jet account and the AES keys, you may found that there are two AES keys for the Cola reports machine account. Only one of them will work. So we will try with both of them and see which one of them works for us. Right. So here you can see that this is different. And this is different, although the NTLM hash is the same. Right. Now, to abuse this unconstrained delegation, we are use, going to use uh, the KRB RelayX master tool, right, from Darky N. And so, how do we abuse? Because we are running it from a machine which is not domain joined, we first need to add a pseudo machine to the domain which points to the IP address of our attacking Linux machine. So first, what we are going to do is we are going to add an SPN and additional host name to the Cola reports, right? So what we are doing here, I think the NTLM hash is different here. So I need to copy this one. And while I'm on it, let me copy the AES keys as well. Uh, so that's one of the AES keys. And that is the second one. Right, so let's add an SPN. Why? Because that we need to add a pointer that is to trick the domain controller. That is what we are going to do. We are going to trick or force the domain controller to connect to a listener on our machine, right? On our attacking machine. So what we are doing here, using the credentials of Cola report, we added an SPN and an additional DNS host name to the Cola report, to the properties of Cola reports. Why? Because a computer account can modify, it has right privileges on self. Uh, once we have done that, right, if you would like to have a look at this, and uh, let's leave it, we will run out of time. So we have added that part. And then we are going to add a DNS record which tells the domain controller. And once again, uh, you will notice that uh, we can do that as a normal computer account. We are not domain admin or anything like that. So now what we are going to do, we are going to modify the DNS records on the domain controller to add that srv11.cola.local points to 192.160.2.1, which is our current machine. Oh, wrong NTLMesh, my bad. 
So let me try this again with the new hash. So let's run this. So we have now added a DNS record. Now what we simply need to do is, let me open up a new session, a new terminal, and here we'll start the listener, right? So let's try, and once again, it will run with just one of the AES256 keys. Let's try with this one first. Okay, so we've started a listener here, and from another terminal, we are going to uh, use the printer bug. So what is printer bug? Using printer bug, a normal user can trick, not a not trick, I can force any uh, machine, including the domain controller, to connect to it, right? So that is what we are going to do now. So, I'm just copying the command so that I do not make typos. So let's use printer bug now. And what is the protection against printer bug? Right now, protect, uh, do not use unconstrained delegation and turn off print spooler on, uh, on your domain controller. So we get an access night. So this means that probably it worked and you will see that we have a ticket for the domain controller in a file in a C cache file here. So let's stop this one right now. Right. Let's export this file name to a variable, which would be used by packet. And we need to copy the secret stump utility from packet here. Right. So we have copied secret stump to the current one. And now we can go ahead and do some magic. No, not magic. It's simply we are running or we are using the credentials of the domain controller to run a very popular attack. What? The DC sync attack. So we just not only abuse unconstrained delegation from a Linux machine, we ran DC sync attack. Right, sort of. That is, we extracted credentials from the domain controller by using the domain controller machine account. Right, and those of you who uh, are familiar with Active Directory abuse, once we have the hashes of this account, the Kirby TGT account, it is game over. As we can simply go ahead now and create a golden ticket. So once we have domain admin privileges, we can talk about the golden ticket. So I'm not going to go into nitty gritties. I don't want to run out of time. But what I can tell you even in this limited time is this one. If we have hash of the Kirby TGT account, which we extracted just now, we can forge a TGT as we saw earlier. TGT is equivalent of having credential of a user in a domain environment. So if we have hash of the KRBTGT or the Kirby TGT account, which we got just now, we can write our own TGT. We can create or forge our own TGT, our own TGT, and whatever we write inside that TGT is assumed to be correct. For example, we can write that this TGT belongs to the domain administrator, and the domain controller will agree because the only validation it does when a TGT is presented to the domain controller is if it can decrypt it. Nothing else is checked, right? What does that mean? That means that by using the KRB TGT hash, we can create a golden ticket. So what is a golden ticket? A golden ticket is a valid TGT which we forge or create to get our domain admin privileges back. And we are discussing this in the domain persistence part what does that mean? That is, if uh, usually, so the problem is usually the Kirby TGT account password is not changed, right? Because people simply don't know, or at least that was the case before Mimikatz made the golden ticket attack popular. So that was the case where 
uh, people want you simply change that. What if what, they want simply uh, touch the Kirby DGT account because it is important for, for the domain, right? So if the uh, password is not changed, so the hash will not change. Sometimes it is not changed for years. So what does that mean that if someone compromises your domain environment once and they have the Kirby TGT hash and you don't change it, then someone would could connect to your environment six years, 10 years, 10 months down the line and they will still have the domain admin privileges. How? Let's see. So once we have these credentials, uh, we are going to the impact it toolkit. Right, and simply run this command. So we created a golden ticket and save it to administrator.ccash. Uh, note that the AES key which we used is for the Kirby TGT, right? CE76, which we extracted from here. Let me find that out. This one, right? That's the one which we are using here, right? And then we simply provide the domain SID, FQDN of the fully qualified domain name, and the user which we want to impersonate. And once that is done, uh, there is nothing much to be done. We simply export it. And then we can use tools like, let's say, WMI exec or SMB exec to access the domain controller, right? So we are running with system privileges on the domain controller, right? Now, finally, of course, once again, we would have the itch to have a metapeter session, right? Let's exit from the previous one, run our listener again, and then we can use our download exec cradle so to get a metapeter session on the domain controller with system privileges, right? So this completes the complete compromise of the domain from here if, if so this is a forest route if there were other domains in the forest we could go ahead and compromise them as well right so this completes our attack path and i believe unfortunately we uh, would not have enough time to cover the the defense part right so i think that would be all from me. Otha, uh, do I have uh, do I have enough time to cover the defense part? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you you do have enough time if you want to cover the defense part. I was on mute. I sorry, do, I do have the time. Yes, you have the time. Oh, oh, great, great, awesome, awesome. So. Now let's go for the defense part, right? Now, when it comes to domain defense, we can uh, have a look at five major steps. I mean, it's not that easy, but we can have a look at five major steps or, or, or uh, changes which can improve security posture of any domain environment. First is to protect and limit domain admins, then isolate administrative workstations, secure local administrators, just in time and just enough administration, that is time bound and just enough administration, and isolating administrators in a separate forest and breach containment using peers and ESAE. Sorry. So uh, first of all, let's have a look at protecting and limiting domain admins. First step, once again, uh, uh, it is easy to say than actually doing it, right? but reduce the number of domain admins in your environment. Of course, the larger the number of domain admins, higher are the chances of them leaving their credentials here and there. 
Also, you may like to not allow or limit logins of DAs to any other machine other than the domain controllers. If a domain admin logs on to any other machine than a domain controller, then there should be no other local administrator on that particular machine, right? Otherwise, it could be possible to steal or extract the credentials of the domain admins, right? Now, a third one is, and this is the most important, by far the most important thing. If you would like to take away just one thing from this workshop, then it should be this. Never ever run a service as a domain administrator, right? Why? Because whatever fancy credential theft have protect protections, for example, if you have protected user scope or if you have credential guard, if you're running LSS as a, a protected process, all of that go out of the window if you are running a service as domain admin. Why? Recall the slide where we were discussing where credentials are stored. Credentials of service accounts are stored in registry in the LSA secrets key. They are not stored in the LSS process. So no matter what type of protection you have for the LSS process, if there is a service account which is running as DA, your credentials will not be protected, right? So please keep that, this in mind. Also, you may like to use uh, or set account is sensitive and cannot be delegated for domain admins. So in that, in those cases, even if your domain admin authenticates to, let's say, a machine where unconstrained delegation is enabled, their credentials would still not be available on that machine, right? So that's for the protection and the protecting and limiting domain admins. You may also like to make use of a very uh, interesting piece of technology included in server, introduced in server 2012 R2, that is protected users group. Please do not confuse protected users group with protected groups. Protected groups are those which are protected by the admin SD holder method, the SD prop uh, process. The protected users group is a different group, which is the textbook definition says better protection against credential theft. Why or how? The credentials of users which are added in this group are not cached in, in secure ways, like no cred SSP, no W digest, NTLM hash is not cached, and Kerberos does not use DES or RC4 keys. So the first two are quite clear. For the third one, if Kerberos does not use DES or RC4 keys, then attacks like Kerberos become a lot harder. Now, if all the domain controllers in the domain are server 2012 R2 onwards and the domain functional level is also server 2012 R2 onwards, then following additional uh, protections are available for the users who are added in the protected users group. Uh, no NTLM authentication, of course. No DES or RC4 keys in Kerberos pre-auth. So it would not be possible to uh, to run the famous ASP wrap roast attack against such users. There is no delegation regardless of you setting it. Uh, that user's credentials would not be usable in constrained or unconstrained delegation. That is, the, uh, the KDC assisted impersonation would not be allowed. And there would be no renewal of TGT beyond initial four hour lifetime. Uh, what, what does that help with that helps with golden ticket attacks right so for example we created a golden ticket which is essentially a tgt in the last hands on and if we want to use that let's say six months down the line it would not be possible if the user is a member of the protected users group why and you cannot change that even with domain admin privileges and that is why enumeration is the key for a successful attack you must uh, have a look at the protected users group whenever you want to, whenever you are in the enumeration phase, right? Uh, there are some cons as well. Those were the pros, these are the cons. Uh, all domain controllers must be at least server 2008. All, and please keep in mind that uh, Microsoft recommends to not add all the EAs and DS to this group, but which is fine. You can use the, let's say the default administrator as the break glass or emergency administrator and not use that user and add all of other uh, your domain admins to the protected users group, right? But please keep in mind that this also means that uh, work culture change is required, 
because what I have observed that, for example, if you have five domain admins and you add four of them to the protected users group and leave just one out, then that would be the domain admin, which would be mostly you, right? <laughs> that is the state of uh, affairs most of the time. Now, also, please keep in mind that uh, cached logon is disabled for the users who are in protected users group. So if for some reason your organization adds uh, the uh, C-level users or the C-level executives to the domain admins group, some of them do, then it would not be possible for them to sign in offline. So please keep that in mind. And once again, if you, uh, you have service accounts or computer accounts added to this group, that would be useless because their credentials are stored in the registry and on the host machine. Uh, next comes isolating administrative workstations. This is a very interesting uh, strategy to protect your administrators. So what a privileged administrative workstations or PAW or a PAW is, it is a hardened workstation, either stationary or mobile, for performing sensitive tasks like administration of domain controllers, cloud intra, sensitive business servers, and a separate workstation or a mobile workstation or a laptop for, for Facebook, right? So you have one thing for administration and another thing for Facebook. So this protects administrators from phishing attacks or credential replay attacks. There are different strategies which can be used for uh, using pause. So what you can do is if your organization uses, uses jump servers to access sensitive servers, let's say the domain and controllers, et cetera, then those jump servers should be accessed only from a PAW. So not only a, a, an architectural change, it is also a work culture change, right? So now what are the strategies? Uh, one uh, very simple and the first thing which comes to mind is to have separate privileges and hardwares for administrative tasks and normal tasks. That is, you have one workstation for your administrators for administration and another one for Facebook. Right, uh, but this is this uh, includes costs, of course, and some uh, additional interesting uh, threats. So, for example, if you use let's say workstation as uh, as the PAW and a laptop or a mobile workstation for Facebook, that is for non-administrative tasks, then in case there is an emergency and unless you man your crit critical assets twenty four seven it may be possible that even for a very mundane task, one of your administrators may have to drive to office if there is an emergency. But this is still fine. But please, in my opinion, never go for the other way around. That is, you provide a stationary workstation for a Facebook and a laptop as a PAW. In my opinion, never use a mobile workstation or a laptop as a PAW. Why? Because that includes now includes a physical security threat or uh, as well because you never know who is keeping an eye on your administrators right and depending a lot on how sensitive your uh, industry is someone may simply like to snatch it uh, from your administrators right or someone would like to break into their homes or even it can be physically worse for them so in my opinion that uh, would be a disaster uh, one very cost-effective option is to have a VM on a PAW for user tasks, right? So let's say you have a workstation which connects to the jump server and can access the domain controllers then. And then you have a VM inside that PAW which can access Facebook, right? So that is a very uh, valid uh, strategy. To secure your local administrators, you may like to use LAPS or local administrator password solution. Uh, with this is uh, like protected user scope. This is from Microsoft and it is free. Uh, what Labs does it when you set up Labs in a forest, it introduces two new attributes: MS MCS ADM PWD, which stores the local admin password in clear text. Please keep that in mind. And MS MCS ADM PWD expiration time, which stores the password expiry for the password. So the idea is that the local administrator passwords for the machines managed by LAPS is stored in clear text in uh, the Active Directory database. 
but only a handful of users by default only the domain admins can read that right so which is fair right if if uh, microsoft stores it in encrypted format and the keys stored on the domain controller it is same to have the password stored in clear text and controlling the access by acls but please keep in mind that by careful enumeration it is possible to retrieve which users can read the passwords in clear text and then those users become a very sweet target but still even after that i personally recommend labs it is a fantastic very easy to use password solution and much better than having same or similar passwords on different workstations for local administrators then comes time bound administration jit so just in time administration provides the ability to grant time bound administrative access on per request basis so for example temporary group membership which requires spam actually to be enabled on the forest level which is very easy one click operation uh, if that is enabled you can for example add a domain admin for let's say one hour one hour uh, and that could not be changed i mean the user's tgt would be invalidated after an hour and then you need to add the user again if you want them to provide extended access so this is useful for those scenarios where someone needs the high privileges just for some time right and this is something which microsoft uses very aggressively or recommends very aggressively even in azure active directory the just in just in time administration right in that case it's a bit different but quite similar to one what we have on the on prem actual directory then in time bound administration comes the jea or just enough administration so just enough administration or jea is powershell based remote delegation administration in this case what happens is you create a powershell endpoint on a machine let's say on a domain controller and then you specify which you can specify at least two very interesting things one is which principle that is which user or group can connect to it and second what exactly what commands with what parameters can they execute once you define these two things those users even if they have non admin privileges they can connect to the machine and run the only the specified commands with administrative privileges right but the restriction is so severe here that you can specify let's say that the uh, that the user can only run for example the get service commandlet with the name parameter it is a uh, modular up to that level right so this this is super helpful to avoid increasing number of administrators administrators in your environment next comes the administrative tier models so uh, in this case you can so this model comprises of three levels only for administrator accounts tier 0 contains those accounts groups and computers which have privileges across the enterprise like das dcs that is domain controllers eas etc tier 1 contains those entities which are uh, you critical for business value for example server admins or those servers which run app your applications etc tier 2 contains those accounts and computers which have access to a large number of workstations like help desk now among these three tiers there are two types of restrictions control restrictions that is what the admins of a tier control and log on restrictions where admins can log on to so if in case of control restrictions uh, if the admins of tier 0 want they control that if a machine should be moved to tier 1 similarly admins of tier 1 can control if a machine or a user should be moved to tier 2 it is the but the other way around is not uh, possible but in case of log on restrictions it is the reverse admins of tier 0 cannot log on to tier 1 admins of tier 1 cannot log on to tier 2 but if required and if allowed admins of tier 1 can log on to tier 0 and tier 2 to tier 1 so if an admin of a higher privileged tier do, does not log on to a lower tier chances of their credentials being stolen um, reduce drastically now the next question comes is how do we manage this super critical tier 
for that microsoft recommends esae or enhanced security admin environment or the famed red forest uh, so a red forest is a dedicated administrative or bastion forest so the administrators of tier 0 live or log on to this admin forest and from there they manage the tier 0 there is just one way access that is even if their credentials are stolen from here there is no way that someone can authenticate back to it because the trust is just one way also there is selective authentication in between that is only a limited set of machines are accessible for the users or the administrators from the admin forest and there is an additional uh, feature with it is that is the pam trust in if pam trust is in use the administrators from the admin forest even need not authenticate to tier 0 they can simply use sid history to access tier 0 so all of this to protect your super powerful domain admins right so uh, then some of the events which you can have a look at for example for golden ticket we can have a look at 4624 and 4672 on the dc and traffic analysis of kerberos traffic for the TGS request message may also be helpful. For ACL attacks, unfortunately, there is no logging by default, but you can have a look at these security events once you enable audit policy for object, for a particular object, right? You can also have a look at, uh, you can also use the AD ACL scanner, which can compare your ACLs with golden images, etc. Some of the architectural changes, once again, these are free. We can use the Windows Defender Credential Guard. I know that Mimikets can bypass it. Still, it would be super helpful in protecting against uh, credential theft attacks, right? Uh, application uh, whitelisting, having an allow list using device card or even app locker, that will also help. Much better than relying solely on an, any antivirus, right? So, and, and, um, so Windows Defender Application Control, which was formerly known as Device Guard, it is an application whitelisting solution, which allows only known good to run. Of course, there are bypasses. Why? Because what is the definition of known good? A very popular definition of known good is if a binary or an executable is signed by Microsoft, we can assume that it is good. But there are many Microsoft signed binaries like PowerShell.exe, CSC.exe, MS Build, which can be used to run untrusted code. But still, even with these lacunas, even with these bypasses, this is still very useful, right? So that would be all from me. Thank you very much for listening to me, right? And uh, we can have a look at our labs, etc. If, if you like the workshop, thank you very much. Thank you. I know everyone's giving you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, so once again, the recordings will um, will happen. Uh, we will definitely send them out. I just want to share a couple of things with you guys, and then um, you can enjoy the the rest of your weekend. So definitely appreciate you. Um, spending your time with us. Uh, one of the things that Cisco we want to do is, is to bring you um, information to help you understand these particular attacks, right? So this is the reason why we partner with Pentester Academy, the Kill, to, to give you this information. And so they have an attacking Active Directory class. They have the defending Active Directory lab, and they also have a red team lab that one of the um, participants mentioned that they wanted to attend as well. So definitely check out these resources. And um, if you're spending money on Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus, this is cheaper than all those three things combined. Um, another thing too, we, we want you to have some sort of game plan. So you're understanding these attacks and these attacks will happen in some form or fashion. So as you come up with this game plan, you want to be able to figure out what is your halftime adjustment. So if you're up in the fourth, the, the first half of a game, then you start losing. When you get to that halftime, you have to make 
some sort of adjustment. So here are some tools that, that Cisco um, that we utilize to help you with these particular attacks. So we have a product called um, Titration that can do the application dependency mapping in your environment. So this isn't based on any type of template, but it actually goes out and discovers what's happening in your environment. And you can do application firewall and segmentation as well. If you see a process or something that you don't like running, you can be able to send a rule to um, your firewall to actually help mitigate that particular attack. And then one of the things is just understanding your, your traffic and your environment. So most companies or organizations are using Cisco switches and routers. So one of the things is being able to take advantage of NetFlow, which is free, that comes with your product is built into it. So being able to use that with, with StealthWatch to look at the flow of data in your environment. So you can check and see if there's um, WinREM in your environment, a remote PowerShell. Some users like to use Bloodhound or Sharphound on top of Bloodhound. So just to see where SMB is moving in the environment, how widespread is it? So those are the things that are tells that it takes to help you recognize the traffic that you have. And then some sort of NAC solution. So to be able to tag individuals at the switch, to authenticate them on the network, and not having to worry about implementing private VLANs by just doing tagging. So this is just something that ICE can is ingrained with that you can actually utilize. And then when it comes to your domain controllers, you know, you never want your domain controllers talking to command and control sites. So I had a customer and their active directory is doing CTC traffic, and we found that just by looking at their DNS. So 93% of malware uses DNS. Um, your ransomware uses DNS to pull down the encryption keys. So using something like Umbrella um, will help monitor that DNS traffic to see who's talking to command and control. And then the endpoint solution, so something on the end to help you figure out what's happening, to be able to look at file execution, also to be able to look at name pipes and things of that nature from a search perspective we have something called AMP endpoints. And then it's hired all off at the perimeter, Firepower. So you can use it as an IPS, a file inspection engine, and a firewall. But then the unique thing about it is it has correlation policies. So if my perimeter sees something, it would be pretty good if I can get my switch connected to an end host that's doing something malicious to actually take some sort of action. So these are the things that can be part of your game plan, but the key is you have to have a game plan and you have to make some sort of um, concession for your halftime adjustment when those attacks happen. Now, that's a lot of stuff, but we been looking at the industry and so a few years ago, we came something called CTR, which is a free. So this is not anything that we're um, there's a charge for it, so Cisco is getting into this open source community as far as giving things away for free and not nickel and dime you for everything. So CTR is a tool that we actually have that brings together that dashboard of products that you can use to take some sort of mitigation um, techniques to. Now, what we also did is recently we introduced something called SecureX. So this is CTR with its big board pants on, and what that means We've done a lot more third-party integration, still free, but we wanted to kind of beef up the support with our third-party integrations because we all know that you can't have only Cisco products in your environment because we don't cover everything, right? So we wanted to have a platform that allow the integration of third-party products that's free and then to give you that one dashboard, that one ring to rule them all. So we still have the dashboard. You can get the matrix as far as what's happening in your environment from your devices that is being pulled in. So this helps with the operational flow of your environment. And more importantly, you still have the capability of having this marketplace. Although it says marketplace, still free. Now, some third parties may want to charge you, but basically this platform is free. Now, you have the marketplace with recommended third-party integrations, and then you can use that to integrate things into your environment because it all boils down to how quickly you can find things and remediate activities in your environment. And then when you go back to the dashboard, 
on the right hand side, easy to find threat hunting in your environment because you want to quickly discover things. So you have that capability and inclusive of looking for incidents that it has earmarked. And based upon those incidents that it has earmarked, you can start some sort of action, right? So in this ribbon, you can pivot back to CTR and start investigating. So CTR is that bouncer at the club. So if I find a targeted in my environment, I can do some sort of isolation for that particular host, and I don't have to actually jump to a product to do it. So some like function as far as an aggregate for everything, but also I can take some sort of action for those particular products, and not have to jump to those products. So this shows me seeing a domain, I'm blocking it, uh, I did endpoint isolation for a particular host. So this is that CTR, still using it. We just enhanced it with Secure Acts with the third party integrations. We can do forensic snapshots as well. You have all this stuff in a fancy tool. And the key thing about you want to be able to figure out what your internal targets are in your environment that may have been compromised or how widespread an attack is so you can determine when can you call the incident response team. And then give you some information about the files associated with those targets that cause that red flag and even the file name and the file path. And then enrich it with local sightings in your environment and then globally what have you seen. So all this, 399, 7,000 users using it, no cost to you. So we just want to keep that in mind that we're trying to increase your, uh, your knowledge of your environment and then give you the tools and the processes to actually mitigate attacks in your environment. Because at the end of the day, the question is how well do you cover yourself? So with that, definitely appreciate you guys taking the time. We ran over, but the discussion was good. And we will definitely get you the recording of this event so you can um, use it because a lot of information was given and some things may have been over to someone's head. So now you have the chance to actually uh, review the material. So thank you for attending and enjoy the weekend.